Hello, Tab Nation. It is I, Tom. Today, we're going to be learning about directives. You can call them settings also, but it's just ways to change how your script works versus kind of the default that's built into AutoHotKeys. So I hope you guys enjoy and learn something new. So the first one we're going to be talking about here is uh, you're using the hashtag or pound, depending what generation you're from. I'll go with the pound symbol. Pound, allow same line comments. Now this one's actually only used in version two of AutoHotKeys. In version one, you can do this, but in version two, you can't. Not really sure why they added the need where you have to make this setting. I, I like it the other way in version one. So <clears throat> in version one, putting like sleep, one's a little too small, but like sleep 500, this comment is a line comment. This would work perfectly in auto hotkeys without this. But in version two, you need to add this in order to be able to do this. If you do not have this, a comment does need to be on its own line away from a command. The next one we got is <clears throat> pound clipboard timeout. And you just put your milliseconds here. Uh, you know, you can put milliseconds 500 or 5,000. That's five seconds. So you put whatever you want there. And basically what that does is at any point you're trying to access the clipboard, if something's going wrong with your computer and it's unable or your script and it's unable to access it after X amount of time, it's basically just gonna time out and it's not gonna work. And it should give you an error, I believe. The next one we got here is uh, pound comment flag, new string. So this is kind of a C++ example. So in auto hotkeys, when you write a comment, you usually use the semicolon here, but maybe that's not your style. You use another programming language like C++, and you want to use the kind of way they comment out. You can change that. So you just do ha hashtag comment flag, and we're going to do the two little uh, dashes there. And then message box test one, this is a comment. So this would work after I make that change. But if I accidentally did it the old way and I did this message box, all this test or text that normally would be a comment would actually show up in the message box just because I have changed the settings from that to that. The next one here, we're going to do pound hotkey interval and then whatever milliseconds we want. So here I'm using 2000. Now this really plays in with also using max hotkeys per interval. So what this is saying is basically for every two seconds or 2000 milliseconds, I only want 200 kind of like buffered out hotkeys commands or functions being in there. Without this kind of stuff, uh, the default, basically like if you've ever had a loop that's doing some like sin command or whatever, and you push your thing, there's no sleeps in there, nothing. It's going to go so fast that the computer can't execute your lines that fast. And you're actually going to pop up and it's like, hey, you just try to perform a thousand, you know, commands in two seconds. Do you want to, you know, quit the script or execute, you know, re-execute it? So this one, you know, it's good if you want to have it out there to be able to handle more but honestly like if your script's actually ever getting that warning your script's working way too fast or you need a much more powerful computer that can handle something like that but you're probably not going to have something strong enough to basically go beyond the default in auto hotkeys so the next one here is uh, pound hotkey modifier timeout 100 uh, by default, I believe it is 50 milliseconds. And what this is doing is if you create, for example, a hotkey that uses control or alt, and then you're doing like a send ABC, basically what auto hotkeys is doing here is it's going to first, before it does that send, it's going to release the control alt, because if you're still holding that control down or that alt, it can affect what happens when that ABC gets sent. It could do control a, which has a complete different meaning than just pressing A. Same with uh, Alt-A. 
it's going to do something like, you know, select all your text when all you really wanted to do was send an A, B, C. Uh, this basically, once it's done it, what it's supposed to do, it's going to release that key and check if you're still pressing it. So if you're someone who's maybe just like a little bit slower at releasing keys versus tapping them, this is something you might want to change to be a little bit slower just to help you if you're, you know, kind of a really slow person at releasing that. This is something I could definitely see if, you know, you're gaming and you just have that habit of holding the keys down. And it's basically, it's, it's going to wait and see if it's past that period and you're still holding that key down. In order to execute your thing again, you can't just push Control A, Control A, Control A. You're actually going to have to release and then press again. So this is something you would really have to play around just to see what works best for you. I honestly uh, never had a problem using the default 50, but maybe you do. So the next one we got is using hot strings here. This one's pound hot strings. Um, there's lots of variations of a lot of these that I'm actually showing you. If you want to learn more, definitely go to the Auto Hockey website. I'll link down to the directives here, and you can get a little bit more deep dive into them. I'm just kind of showing you like basic examples so you can understand what is maybe possible out there, and then just manipulate it to anything you need. So there's a lot of different things you can do with, you know, hot strings. I'm just using RC, and that is basically saying that it is case sensitive now. So with a hot string, you type in, in case you don't know what they are, CEO, push space or enter, and it's automatically going to actually replace that text with chief executor officer. This is just a faster way to type basically with common phrases that you are using. But since this is case sensitive, with this being a capital CEO, I would actually have to push shift and then CEO or have my caps lock on obviously and that would trigger. Now to turn that off, you can do hot string C0, and now it's CEO. So even though this is lowercase, I could still push shift CEO, and this would still execute no matter what. So regardless if it's capitalized or not, but if you want it. So up here, we could actually do something like this, where we actually have both. These are exactly the same, but I could put like one, two here, and if I do shift CEO, I get this one. But if I just do CEO by itself, I would get this answer instead. Now, this one's probably one of my favorite ones. This is really cool. I don't get to use it a lot, but I've always thought this one was really neat. So this one is pound if mouse is over. And once again, I'm just kind of showing basic examples here. We're doing auto hockey class, which you use a lot. I've done a video about that. And we're doing shell tray window or uh, shell underscore tray w and d <clears throat> and what that means is if my mouse is hovering over the tray window these hotkeys right here are going to work but if i'm like hovering right here where my mouse currently is these won't work so it's really cool to have it so that hotkeys only work at like specific areas within a program with on your desktop you know whatever speaking of a program for this one, we're doing mouse over, win title, and we're just going to do like a get mouse position. And uh, this one's basically saying if, let me move my screen here, if so if my mouse is hovering here, it's not going to get the mouse position. But if my mouse is hovering up here on the window title, it will get it. So that's one that's really cool. I like this a lot, especially on the desktop. If I'm in a program, there's a lot of hotkeys I might not want working. Um, because I use them for, you know, normal stuff that's in the program. But then I can just move my mouse down to the tray and suddenly it's going to switch all my hotkeys on. So that one's like by far probably one of my favorite ones that I have. But yeah. Next, we got input level, pound input level one. By default, it is zero. Um, so what we're doing here is when I push numpad zero, it's going to click the left mouse button, right? Well, down here in my script, I have less left mouse button, right? Well, if it's at a zero and I click numpad, only this would work. But if I have it set for one, this is going to trigger. This is going to trigger. And when this triggers, it's then going to trigger this. And message box clicked. 
So basically what I'm doing here, and, and there's honestly simpler ways to do this than doing this. You can just honestly duplicate this and change it. But what this is doing is basically with message box click, I can either click the left mouse button or I can click numpad. It's not going to matter. Both of these, it's just a way to assign multiple hotkeys basically to, you know, a command that you want to happen. Like I said, honestly, I, I don't do it this way. There's a little bit of a different way I do it. <clears throat> but this kind of looks a little clean, I guess, in a way. Um, but yeah, uh, another one I've used quite a bit. Not a lot of you are ever going to need to use this, but process priority high. If you ever open your uh, task manager, you can right click on your script and actually say it priority high. And that's just giving it the ability to you know, run at a high priority. I've had to use this on scripts where I've had 80,000 lines of code and there's just so much going on there that it, it tends to lag a lot, but changing it to high has helped a lot in scripts like that. Like I said, I doubt a lot of people watching this are gonna be writing 80,000 lines of code, but just in case you are, this is the best way to do it in case you don't wanna manually go into your task manager and have to do it all yourself. The next one we got is key history. So as you're typing on your keyboard, your computer is remembering kind of what you've said previously. You know, auto hotkeys is really a good example of that is when you're using um, hot strings here. You know, even though the last key I typed was O, it still remembers that my last two keys were E and C. So it's watching what you're doing. So you can change how much is being stored there. And then if you want to display that information, you can just do key history as a command. Uh, by default, key history is, let's take a look here. I think it's like 50. Why can't, here we go. It is alphabetized. Yeah, it looks like it's 50. Or 40. Okay, it looks like it might be 40 then. So by, by default, it does 40. But if you want to keep track of a lot more information than that, you can do, you know, 100, 1,000, as long as you have, you know, all that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, max memory. I uh, Basically, if you want to change this, uh, if this is really useful when you're using variables, uh, your string is just, like, insanely long. Like, you're trying to copy an entire essay into a variable. Uh that is definitely something that could help you. Uh, by default, that is 64 megabytes. So let's say we are copying like entire essays. Maybe I need to up it to 256. So that way it can use that memory to store that amount of information. Now you would have to have a pretty large string being stored in order for you to really hit that problem, which I have done. I have copied hundreds of pages from a PDF, and I've needed something like this before. So, yeah. And then, what, where are we here? Next, we got max thread. We're setting it to 2. So, by default, I believe this is 10, but let's say we want to drop it down to 2. What this could cause problems with, especially with dropping it, is how many threads you can run, which is basically how many things can be happening within your program. And this is really going to affect something like set timers. If I push a hotkey and it's you know got a whole bunch going on, and a timer goes off, that timer might not actually really work when I want it to, just because it's not able to put that in there and you know kind of do that. So. Going higher is usually what people want to do, but this some <clears throat> it's really going to depend on what you're trying to do. <clears throat> Sorry, dry throat. Max thread per hotkey. Uh, this is helpful if your script is running very fast. It's kind of how you're buffering whenever you push a hotkey. How much stuff can basically be ready to go? Uh, you're going to put three. This also kind of plays around with that at the same time. So yeah, pound symbol, no environment is what this one means, no E in V, and this is really good to put honestly in a lot of scripts, and this is just uh, prevents your script from checking empty variables, uh, so it's going to help speed the script up a little bit, especially if you're using a lot of variables that are going to be put in there. Uh, no tray icon, basically uh, if you've been using auto hotkeys, 
when you run a script down on your taskbar, there's sometimes a little arrow, or it might just actually be displayed right there. When you right click on it, you can exit, you know, about that kind of stuff. That will get rid of this. If you do this though, you do need to add a way to close your program, maybe by adding, you know, like F2 reload or F2 exit app. There's a few different things you could do that you would be missing if you didn't have no tray icon. Uh, percent. So what this is going to do, this one's uh, mostly you're going to use if you do not actually have a hotkey. So if you don't have a hotkey in your script at all, once it completes what it's supposed to do, the script actually shuts down. So if you have a script that there is no hotkey, but maybe you're using like a set timer, you definitely want to put this there because then it will keep your script running. It, I mean, if you don't want to use this, you can always just randomly in your script also just put something like F1 uh, return. And that will at least keep your script running. So these basically do the exact same thing. Obviously, hey, the less lines of code, the better. So let's go with that one. That way you're using less lines of code. Next one is requires. So this one is basically saying that you have to use a certain version of auto hotkeys. So it is requires auto hotkey version 1.1.33. And then if we add that plus there at the end, that's basically saying as long as it's higher than this version, it the script will run. If I got rid of that plus, then I would have to have this exact version. And I'll put all this code in the script. Our description below obviously message box the script will run only on version 1.33.00 and later releases single instance force so this if you try to run a script and then run it again you might notice that you sometimes get a message box that's basically saying like hey you're already running this do you want to you know not run this new one or do you want to re you know quit the old one run this new one so if you do off you can run your script as many times as you want you can have the same script running five times but be warned when not even just with when running the same script but running any type of script you know script a script b if you have the same hotkey for example f1 in both scripts the newest script that you run is what's going to trigger when you push F1. It's going to overwrite any duplicate hotkeys from the other script. So I know a lot of people think that they can duplicate their scripts, push F1, and then it'll almost be like multi-threading. Yeah, that's not going to work. Uh, force, that is basically going to get rid of that message box. It's like checking reload automatically for you. So if you're if you're constantly reloading, especially when you're testing, it can be kind of annoying to have to push, you know, that button on that pop-up box every single time. You can just add force to the beginning of your script, and it'll just automatically skip that message box and do it for you. I use this a lot when I am testing scripts because it just saves a lot of time, and it's, you know, I'm not moving my mouse down into the middle of the screen every single time. That's annoying. Then we got warn, hashtag or pound warn. By default, this is off. So if you just put this on here, it's going to turn it on. And you're basically, anytime a warning of some sort is in your script, you're going to get a message box from it. So this can be good for testing if you're just having issues. So it's kind of, I guess, could be used for debugging in a way. I don't really use it too often. It's kind of annoying, I think. <laughs> it gives me warning sometimes if there's stuff I don't even care about. Um, but yeah, you can play around with that, see if it works for you. And the last one we got here is win activate force. So this one's a little weird. It, it's kind of hard to explain, but just to put it in a very simple way, like I said, all these you can look a little deeper into if you wish. Win activate force. Uh, so when you're using a, you know, like win activate, you know, to pull up that window to the front, it does kind of it in a gentle way. But sometimes some 
programs just like won't work with win activate sometimes very well so you're doing force and that's like a real brutal way of pulling it forward there is going to be really no improvement in speed or anything you're only ever going to use this if basic win activate is not working and you know there's a lot of stuff of why win activate might not work before getting to needing to use this maybe you're using the wrong id or you know the wrong name misspelled you know stuff like that this is kind of a like a last try kind of thing uh it, i mean it really doesn't affect your computer in any way it doesn't make your script faster so you're, you're probably never going to use this if you have any questions i will put the link in the description where most of this stuff is definitely check that out if you still can't figure it out hit me up in the comments below i know there's a lot more i didn't cover so at some point in the future i am going to do part two doing the other half of this kind of stuff and if you have any recommendations on something maybe you want to see redone and get an actual example of it in the next video definitely also let me know and hit that subscribe button one or two videos every week with automation, mostly centered around auto hotkeys. And if you haven't seen yet, I've actually started doing hardware stuff using breadboards and whatnot. So I do stuff where I'm using like this right here. This is an RIFD reader. It hooks up to my computer and a lot of other cool stuff. So if you ever want to get into hardware, I will be mixing hardware and software together eventually on how to make them kind of communicate with each other very well. And even using auto hotkeys to communicate with these devices to do different types of tasks. Also, if you haven't noticed, I have changed my channel's name. It is no longer auto hotkey, uh, well, tab nation auto hockey. It's tab nation automation. Just because, one, I think it sounds better. It kind of flows. And then the second reason is because I am... Most of my channel, 90% of it, is auto hotkeys, but I have done tutorials on JavaScript, that kind of stuff, and now I'm doing some hardware videos here and there. So, hope you're okay with that, and I'll see you next time.